Hello, everyone, and a big warm welcome. I'm Andrea Hoiduha, partner and co-head of capital at Antla. I'm super excited to welcome all of you here to the third session of our Window into Progress digital events. They're hosting this series to give you a closer look inside Antla's investments approach and a unique vantage point from 27 cities across six continents. Our first two events in the series focused on trends we are seeing on the ground in the US, India, Europe, and Brazil, and how we source and assess exceptional founders around the world. In today's session, we are focusing on standard portfolio companies, emerging leaders in some of the most exciting sectors on the planet. What are the qualities that make the founding teams of highly successful companies stand out? Who are some of the breakout companies in the Antler portfolio? To answer these questions, we'll kick off with a conversation with Aaron Harris, a new Antler Advisory Board member and former Y Combinator partner, to hear his perspectives as a seasoned investor. Then, we'll be hearing from founders of three breakout companies in Antler's portfolio. First, Ribello, the world's leading marketplace for refurbished tech and sustainable lifestyle products. Second, Clara Me, a mental health app that uses language-based AI to make cognitive behavior therapy available to everyone. And then last but not least, Ammo, a space tech company delivering the most precise and almost real-time greenhouse gas monitoring service. Then we will open things up for Q&A. Thanks to everyone who has already submitted questions. Please be sure to post any additional questions in the chat. So let's get started. Aaron, super, super happy to have you here with us today. Uh, a little bit about your background. Uh, as I mentioned, you recently joined our advisory board. You co-founded a company called Magid and Company, which offers un uh, conflicted fundraising advice to founders. And uh, previously, uh, you were partnered by Combinator and funded over a thousand companies. You were instrumental in, in building YC Series A program and helped founders raise over 3 billion US dollars across 200 plus Series A's and Series B's. Before joining YC, you founded and led Tutor Space, a marketplace for high quality tutoring that raised from Sequoia and YC. Uh, you frequently appear as an expert voice uh, on early stage fundraising in tech and business media like Forbes, TechCrunch as Insider. So I think without further ado, uh, we definitely want to hear some of your views on what's happening currently in the market and uh, what are the key things that you have observed um, throughout your investment career as it pertains to uh, early stage founders. Um, so we mentioned that you had the opportunity to fund and work with some of the best founders in the world to name some of the companies that you personally led investments in. Uh, it's Deal, Scale, uh, OpenSea, Modern Treasury, Lattice, Podium, uh, Ajabe and Grow. Um, now, could you walk us through the decision making process when evaluating some of these investments uh, and the critical factors you considered before making these commitments? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Andrea, and, and to the entire Antler team for putting the event together, um, and also for that uh, overly generous introduction. Um, I was happy to be in the right place at the right time and learn from some incredible people along the way. Um, you know, the, the, the process of evaluating uh, a set of founders and an idea, I think, changes depending on what you're looking at and what the stage is at which you're investing. Most of the companies that you mentioned are founders that I met through YC at the earliest possible moment in the life of the company when it was really, you know, a couple founders and an idea, um, or sometimes a couple founders without an idea, or, you know, in the case of things like deal and scale, a couple founders with a really bad idea, um, or an idea that, that didn't seem as good as the founders did. And so the way that I always thought about trying to pick at the earliest stage was about finding the mix of founder and idea we're not necessarily that combination with the founders and that idea was going to work, but where I thought they would figure it out. And one of the things that I always like to look for in an interview and, and the way YC did things, you know, we read applications and then did these 10 minute interviews is I wanted to understand whether or not the founder was thinking deeply about things. Had they gone several levels deep and could answer the questions, you know, that I could come up with in 10 minutes, not knowing anything about what they're doing. And when they hit roadblocks, would they, adapt? Would they push back? Or would they kind of become brittle and shatter against pushback and, and things they didn't know? And 
it really is very much a feel and you're, you're looking for things and looking for patterns and trying to find what's good. And then ultimately you just take a bet and you have to tell a story. And for me, investing startups, it's, it's really about stories. And at the end of the day, you have to be able to tell yourself a story that says, Hey, I think that these founders can build a company that's worth more than a billion dollars, more than a billion. Who knows if it's a billion, if it's a hundred billion, if it's a trillion, I don't think anyone has an idea. But you, can, you need to be able to smell something very, very large and tell a credible story of how, they, of how that team could get there before you're willing to invest. So you're talking a little bit about team. You're talking, talking about you know, the team's um, affinity to their subject. You're talking about the chemistry between the team. You're talking about individual knowledge. Um, you know, what, 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 can, you, can you sort of distill down this a little bit further of like, what were those things that you were smelling when you actually thought, okay, this is really interesting. I really want to bag these guys. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a set of things that I think would sound particularly weird to, to anyone who's thought about investing or who has met founders. You want to find people who are exceptionally ambitious who understand um, that they have the ability to build something huge. Um, they need to have demonstrated the capacity to actually do things. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't ascribe to the theory that, that, you know, ideas are, ideas are meaningless and execution is everything. I actually think that's wrong. I think the two have to be in balance, um, mm -hmm. but you don't want to invest in someone that's only ever just, had ideas and never built something, whether with their hands or with other people. Um, it doesn't have to be something professional. You know, we look for people who had just done, done interesting things that might be unexpected, um, whether that's at school or, or wherever it was. Um, and so you need the ambition, you need the evidence that they can actually do stuff. Um, and then evidence that they're willing to run through, you know, to use a kind of, uh, uh, hackneyed, phrase they're willing to run through walls uh, because you do at the end of the day have to kind of break down lots of things that shouldn't work and you mostly fail right startups are like just days and days and years and years of mostly failure with enough success that you overcome the failure and when you succeed it's just it's so um large in magnitude that the failure kind of falls away yeah, I was reading that you, 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 you know, you were part of the funding team in some shape or form, or form, or of over thirty unicorns. Right, that's an incredible, mm -hmm. that's an incredible number. Uh, hoping to have thirty unicorns this year in the globe in twenty twenty three. Um, so, so is there, is there, a, would you, would you, would you answer my question, uh, my previous question, a little bit differently if I just said to you, okay, what are the key characteristics of unicorn founders? So I, I wouldn't actually answer it differently because I think the only thing that you're ever trying to invest in is companies worth billions of dollars. And so that's got to be the lens that you use when evaluating an opportunity. If you're just trying to invest in things that are going to be worth at most a few, you know, 10 million, a hundred million dollars, you can make a lot of money that way. It's just not the way that I think about investing. And the reason it's, you know, let's say it's 30 unicorns and not a thousand unicorns. Why weren't they all successful? Well, the odds are bad, right? Like the odds are just yeah. really, really unlikely. And so you can have two teams, each of which seem just as good as the other. Um, their ideas seem amazing. And then something happens where it doesn't work out, whether it's the founders end up fighting with each other and the team breaks up. The technology ends up not working as well as they thought. They turn out not to be able to raise the capital they need, you know. I've seen more versions of the startup dying than I have of the startup succeeding. And if I was to say, why, you know, why is deal as good as it is, right? What, like, what is it about that company that went from Schwo and Alex pitching uh, their original idea to this, you know, 12 plus billion, or I don't know what the last valuation is, um, rapidly growing, one of the fastest growing companies in history why like what what is it in there that made that happen and look i could point to things right i could say that you know schwo is one of the best sort of growth and go-to-market people i've ever encountered and alex is incredibly good at rallying people and having vision of what he needs to do um 
Alex's dad, Philippe, who's been part of the company right from the start, had the execution experience on building a legal infrastructure on the back end so that they could, you know, embrace regulatory environments all over the world. But, you know, you could say these things about a dozen other companies and yeah. most of them don't work. And that one did. And I don't know I, if I if I had the perfect answer there, I, I'd have, I guess, more than even more great investments. Yeah, even more. Um, so t talking about picking something out of this of market timing, I mean, do, what do we currently, obviously, we have a very challenging macroeconomic background, um, which particularly at this time around impacted, um, you know, technology investments and private investments. And I guess one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you around is to what extent do you care about market timing, um, either as an investor and as, 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 as a founder? I don't think you can pay that much attention to it when you're at the early stage. I think at the later stages at, at growth and at crossover market timing is super important. Um, I think as a founder thinking about what to start, you can't think about macro. Um, yeah. The best macro thinkers in the world are wrong, you know, 45% of the time. Uh, I've exactly worked at Bridgewater 45? Associates. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't remember what the number was like at Bridgewater Associates though, you know, probably the one of the best macro hedge funds in the world in the world you know, yeah. if you look at the win rate on bets the win rate isn't 90 percent on bets i think you know the the win rate in the portfolio on individual bet levels like 55 percent or whatever it was and that was when you do that you make because of the hedge fund you make yeah. billions of dollars but for a founder to try to understand what you know like interest rates are going to be in five years is irrelevant right to what they need to do today and what yeah. a founder needs to do tomorrow and, and what happened. Now, that said, there are probably some overall market questions you can't ignore, but it comes back to the thing I said earlier, which is if as a founder, you can tell a story about the success of your business, about where that business is gonna be in 10 years, largely because of things you control, yeah. that's the bet to make. If your bet is, well, this will only work if X, Y, Z, and one thing happens in the larger macro environment, that's not a good bet. You know, if you're betting, oh, this thing will only work if oil prices drop below $70 a barrel and stay there for six years, that you can't control that. Yeah. And the best founders, you know, I'll add something to what I said earlier. My favorite trait in founders and the thing that's so hard to find is that I found that the best founders take external problems that face their startups, external blockers, and they figure out how to solve them internally. And they consistently do that. They don't let external factors be their blockers. They mm -hmm. figure out how to get around things and turn them into things that are within their control. Yeah, I, 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 the one last question, I think, because we're running out of time. And one of the things that I wanted to pick up on as you were talking about, um, you know, what is happening currently in the venture ecosystem, um, mm -hmm. is there is there going to be a change, uh, a shift in how VCs are interacting with founders? What do you see already that's happened in the last, um, you know, six months since since, you know, uh, we had an unprecedented um, uh, event um, earlier this year uh, where the bank that supports, the largest bank that supports our ecosystem um, has suddenly collapsed. Um, how do you see uh, the future is shaping up and the relationship between venture, capitals, uh, venture capital industry and the founders? I mean, I th look, I think the industry is certainly in flux. Um, a lot of what I did when I left YC was trying to, I was trying to think about the way that I thought the world was going to change in our ecosystem. It's changed in ways that I wouldn't have expected. Um, on the good side, I, I think investors having a little more time to get to know founders and founders getting more time to know investors before they consummate, you know, a, a series A or a series B. I think that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, what you're starting to see is investors are taking more of companies than they were, you know, um, uh, a few months, even a few months ago. And I think that's kind of negative, but I, I think these things will find their, everything will find its level and will like innovation doesn't stop because financial services and financial mechanics change a little bit. The relationship changes a bit, but I think the forward progress of the overall system will continue to go. And I think that that's, that's why we do this.
for sure certainty and innovation aaron thank you so much for joining us today thank you uh, and we'll speak to you shortly thanks a lot um thank you we talked about some visionaries uh previously some uh, founders who founded some incredible companies um uh let's talk about the future visionaries um so i'm super happy to um welcome our founders here um and we want to hear now from three founders of antler portfolio companies who are solving meaningful problems uh, around the world so first we'll be hearing from ribello uh philip super lovely to have you here today uh it's been a while since we met in person but you've co-founded um uh, Ribello, and you met in one of the earliest residences in Singapore and founded the company in 2019. Uh, you're backed by Antler uh, and you have expanded into six markets and recently raised a significant amount of 50 million US dollar Series A round, uh, backed by a very, very impressive business growth. Um, Philip, welcome. You are the CEO and co founder of Ribello, uh, which is by now the world's leading marketplace for refurbished tech devices and sustainable lifestyle products. Over to you, Philip. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here today. And yeah, happy to tell you a bit more about Ribello and our story since we started at Antler. And yeah, thanks a lot, Andrea. As you shared, we are building a platform focused on refurbished tech and sustainable lifestyle products. And we've been one of, of um, Antler's first investments here in Singapore in 2019. That's also where I met my co-founder Fabian and um, have been since then expanding aggressively. What we want to build is just a platform focused around sustainability and sustainable consumption. And what we enable with Rebello is customers buying their favorite brands such as Apple iPhones, Samsung Galaxy devices, but also drones, gaming, many other devices nowadays in a more eco-friendly way, but most of all in, in a more smart way when it comes to financial decisions. So customers buying on Rebello save on average 50% on their order while getting a device which is nearly as good as new with the same value at which you get when you buy a new device such as accidental damage protection, two years of warranty, having a large um, network of more than 2,000 repair partners, and so on and so on. And by that, we want to just be the leading platform when it comes to future thinking consumption most of our customers are millennials and Gen Z customers who care also what they're doing with the purchase. But for us, it was always important to, to not be just a sustainable tech company, but at the same time to really create some value for the customers and ensure that it's a no brainer choice from them buying a Tribello because they get something which is worth much more than their purchase. And we started as a marketplace, so we don't hold any inventory ourselves. We work together with a small set of dedicated partners with whom we interact very closely and build ultimately a platform for them to do their best to standardize the quality checks for certified pre-owned products. We therefore have a very low quality issue rate. So our quality issue rate is just 3%, which is more or less the same that you have for brand new devices. And therefore have been focusing a lot on being first an APEC focused marketplace for high quality certified pre-owned devices then expanded across the world. Also have a lot of cross-border business nowadays between the US and our markets here in APEC. And are also in the process to launch in currently Canada as our eight markets with the ambition to just be the global leader for what we are doing. And from this on, we started to add more and more services around our platform. So we started to launch our embedded FinTech vertical with supplier financing, but also with our own warranty and insurance verticals and just continued to add more and more value to the whole platform and um, recently launched also the e-commerce as a service concept where we work together with some of the big brands and carriers and ultimately help them to start their e-commerce service, plug in our refurb refurbishing services and partners into their ecosystem, make it just very seamless to operate reverse logistics, um, refurbishing processes, and the great customer experience around the circular economy. As already shared, we've been, um, you know, finding each other, my co-founder and myself in 2019 at, at Antler, and then launched in January, 2020. Since then, we've been growing to about 100 team members all over the world. We had some very good um, growth to about 250 million annual last GMV this year. And thankfully, I've been also doing good in, in every economic climate. So when we started, there was obviously a lot of hype about Southeast Asia. Then there was COVID with many lockdowns in Southeast Asia. And now when we expanded to the US and some other markets, obviously have a very different economic climate than some years ago. But besides this, we've been able to continue and grow our business in, in, in also a very good and not very unprofitable way. Um, so, you know, last year we've been a bit profitable in our first markets. Most of our mature markets are now unit economics profitable. So for us, it was always important since we started that we really focus on the underlying business model and then unit economics. 
This is why we were also um, able to close our Series E round at the start of this year, where we already had the current economic climate, but nevertheless found a very good interest of investors and closed our total six, uh, 50 million Series E round. And when it comes to, to what's next, we're still at the very beginning of our journey. Um, so, you know, we, we just started two years ago and have been able to grow three weeks last year. Um, this year, we want to minimum double in sales. We are a bit ahead on, 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 on that. And uh, what we ultimately want to be is a multi-billion dollar company focused on the circular economy. Refurbished tech by itself is currently a hundred billion dollar global market. And uh, there are not too many companies who are globally tackling this problem. And we have more ideas than that. So we're already expanding in some related categories outside of electronics and the whole circular economy being a $1 trillion market obviously is an exciting opportunity in front of us. And by continuing to expand, but also um, expanding our service offering, working on our embedded insurance and fintech services and um, being ultimately a whole e-commerce as a service end-to-end -end player, we want to be the leading force behind the whole circular economy not only in the markets where we are today, but also continuing to further expand. Next year, we have UK and Mexico on the agenda and many more countries to come next. And what we'll really see now is a lot of arbitrage opportunities and opportunities between the markets. So we have many of our US customers who want to um, you know, operate in Southeast Asia with our help. And we can do this through our recommerce service concept. If we just plug them in into our environment and help them to also sell in countries where they have never sold before. And at the same time, give customers access to many more inventory than they were used to, because nowadays customers have very limited offering of certified pre-owned products in high quality in some markets, but operating uh, around the world and closely working together between the countries, we've seen just that we're able to operate across brands and across categories in a very, very impactful way. Coming to my last slide, obviously for us, it was always important to do something meaningful with our company. And even though we are very for profit for focused and you know focus on uh, profitability and then unit economics a lot, for us, it was always equally important that we make an impact with what we are doing. And are very happy that we see a lot of impact, not only by convincing customers to buy refurbished. So more than 80% of our customers are customers who never buys used, uh, who never purchased used before. So many of them are first time buyers who, you know, didn't want to buy a used device on the C2C marketplace, but with all the value add they get from Rebello, such as, you know, um, two years warranty, accidental damage protection, et cetera, they feel much more comfortable um, buying from us. And that's where we've been able to, you know, get many customers who purchase for the first time and therefore save a lot of carbon footprint, um, but also, you know, drinking water and all the resources which are normally used to produce a phone by convincing them to, to give um, secondhand a chance. And you also see a good of retention level because of that, because many customers who purchase their refurbished device for the first time and are happy with the quality, obviously making the decision more often when it comes to the next purchasing decisions. That's it from my side today, but happy to take your questions afterwards. <laughs> I did. I did have a question, right? As I'm listening to you, um, and uh, listen to Aaron in the last 20 minutes mentioning that actually the idea is actually super important, right? Uh, obviously, execution mm -hmm. on a great idea um, is equally important because without execution, it doesn't get off the ground. But um, I wanted to dig deep a little bit into your experience within the Antler residency. So um, how did you validate the idea of Rebello at the very, very early stage when you first conceptualized it um, within, you know, during, during your, your time with us at the very beginning? Sure. So I think for us, it was super important that we work on an idea which we are passionate about. So we shortlisted three or four ideas, which all had in con a concept that, you know, they do something meaningful for what society. What were they, by the way? Is it, would, would it be funny now <laughs> if you thought back to that? I think very different ones, so one, and in different directions. So, for example, one was a, um, a, also a marketplace, but focused on, on you know products for employees, how we can make their, their lives a little bit more healthier. So, all of them had in common that they had some positive impact, while at the same time tackling large markets, and um, also quite diverse, I have to say. So, two or three in the e-commerce space, but also one or two a little bit out of the box. Um, but yeah, what we then did, did is obviously test them a bit, also for ourselves to to you know recognize where do we see our streams and where do we feel. Um, that we're good at, but at the same time to get some customer input. And then this idea had by, by most of the, the biggest impact from, from customer demand and, you know, um, the, the highest traction of that, that we saw from all the projects we tested. And therefore, I think it was quite impactful for us to see that, you know, there is some real validation. And then it was clear for us that we focus on this talk, idea. Talk a little bit about this validation. Hmm? Talk a little sure. bit about this validation, right? That's quite interesting. Like, to what extent can you validate this at such an early stage? 
So I think we didn't have too much time because uh, back then the Antler program here in Singapore was just um, six weeks and it took me four weeks to find a co-founder. <laughs> so yeah. basically we had two weeks to, you know, validate a couple of ideas. Um, but yeah, therefore it was um, some, some long hours. We built a couple of landing pages and then, you know, run some Google Ads on a very small project. Also obviously went out there and talked to people and I just get the best uh, feedback on this one. But it, I think you can test ideas very basically in a short period of time. Um, just on the one hand with, you know, talking to people, but also running some ads and doing those things which we would do at scale and seeing just what's the resonance, are customers clicking on your ads, are customers, you know, um, signing up for any kind of newsletter or, 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 um, or notifications, etc. And the timing of this, right? How come no one else has done this at, you know, at the same time or have they in, in Asia as you guys kickstarted it? Mm -hmm. Not in Asia, so both of us, my co-founder and myself, have been in, in Europe and we both worked um, in the space. So I was more in the device subscription side, but I knew the space a little bit. And yeah, I think it started in Europe two or three years ago. And I think when it comes to sustainability, it's one of the few things where Europe is in front of the US. <laughs> and I think that's why it hasn't happened anywhere else. So it ha hasn't really happened in the US yet. It hasn't really happened in APEC. And at the same time, we saw that the European companies are very focused on Europe and not that aggressively expanding to other markets. And that's where we saw the opportunity to, you know, just become market leader in APEC, but also to globalize our deal faster than some of the, the players in Europe. Wonderful, Philip. Thank you so much for spending your time with us um, this evening for you, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, please stay on because we are actually receiving uh, quite a lot of questions and we'll come back to you during the Q&A at the end of the session. But for now, thank okay. you, Philip. Um, I'll be moving on to, um, to Claire and me. Uh, as I mentioned, Claire and me uh, was, uh, was founded in 2021. Uh, the co-founders actually met in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the inaugural Antler Residency Program in Berlin. Um, and uh, today uh, we have Selina uh, who's joined us uh, and um, I'm very excited to introduce her. Uh, she's the co-founder of Claire and Me, uh, an AI-based mental health app that's providing an entirely new and accessible channel for cognitive behavioral therapy. Over to you, Selena. Thank you. And I'm so glad to be here. It's such an honor and really appreciated. Um, yeah, I'm Selena from Claire and Me, and we're building Claire, uh, an AI voice bot for anxieties and worries, available 24-7 um, and shame-free. I know this might seem extremely evident today, but it didn't seem so evident a couple of years ago. Um, so let me walk you through a little bit of our journey. So I think um, I think probably everyone is aware that the demand for mental health solution uh, is increasing. So isolation, war, the climate crisis are all factors that play into a approximately 40 percent year on year increase in the demand for mental health solutions. And unfortunately, the supply isn't growing at the same speed, which is leading to a widening gap. And of those people who are in need for mental health support, actually around 50% of them don't want to speak to other people about their mental health, uh, which is because of high stigma, shame, and lack of resources. And this is where Claire is solving for this paradoxical challenge. So Claire is a go-to contact in people's phones to call and message with when feeling anxious or worried, and all that without a human on the other end. Um, we have over 6,000 active users, which are focused um, in the UK, um, and they talk to Claire between three and 30 minutes long. Uh, they will talk about things like their anxieties about going to work or disassembling their worries about relationships or simply meditating before going to sleep. But let me add some color um, uh, while, by introducing an average user to you. Let's call her Sophie. Uh, she is around 38 years old and she's a nurse uh, in a hospital in Manchester. Um, she is likely to have children um, and, but, and does most of the care work for them as well. And she has various sources of worries in her life. And even though she's operating in the healthcare space, her stigma around receiving mental health support is extremely high, um, which is why she, counseling is just not an option to her. So one night she will go on Google and she will, um, she will search for uh, talking to someone about uh, her mental health um, completely anonymously and finds Claire. So she signs up through WhatsApp and starts messaging there, shares what she's worried about. And then Claire will provide a cognitive behavioral therapy based exercise to her uh, called the worry window uh, in, in that scenario, for example, which is an exercise supposed to help time box the worry so it doesn't consume the entirety of people's lives. And while briefly talking about it, Claire suggests to jump on a quick call um, to so Claire can actually share uh, what she's what she's worried about. 
they do so. And after like an eight minute long conversation, Sophie shares to feel more relaxed and actually less stressed. And so they end the call. And conversations like that is what our users do on a daily basis. Active users on average have nine interactions in a week. And they manage to reduce their bad moods um, with an average of 60% over the course of nine months. Uh, we also have really good retention um, with 43% staying on in the 14th and month as well. So for two years, we've been uh, combining um, LLMs like GPT-3 with proprietary technology. As I said, this seems very evident now, but two years ago, it was actually quite out there. Um, uh, and we're focusing on domain models as well as the application layer with the proprietary technology that we're building. Um, particularly things that we are working on are uh, the memory function of Claire. If you have interacted with the chat GPTs of this world, uh, you might know that there is quite limited memory available, uh, but this is something that's extremely helpful in the mental health context. Um, and so we're faced with the challenge of organizing thousands of data points that we get uh, via messages and calls um, of people with Claire and then playing them or, or, or putting them back to people uh, in a way that actually aids them. At the same time, um, we're expanding from a deterministic to a probabilistic um, speech model, uh, facilit aiming to ease the conversation flow, while at the same time sticking to CBT guidelines, which is extremely important to us. And we have the first, um, we have the first automated decision live for a couple of weeks now with an accuracy of 75%. Obviously, as we're operating in the mental health space, um, working on the emotional artificial intelligence is extremely important to us. Um, so we aim on expanding the variables that we're taking into, considering of the, uh, into consideration of the decision making uh, from verbal um, and contextual variables to um, signals that we can derive from the voice um, or even biometric data that we can get from hardware that uh, people use while also using Claire. In the last couple of months, we have um, finished control testing. We've also really focused on stabilizing our tech infrastructure um, and started building um, our proprietary AI models, which is also going to be the focus for the, for the next uh, for the next couple of months, um, and also focusing really on the go-to-market strategy as the product has been pre-revenue till date. Emilia and I actually met um, at Antler uh, in the first Berlin cohort uh, two years ago. So 2021 is when we met. Um, and we've since been joined by Christian as well. Um, we have raised uh, 3 million euros to date um, and have built a team of 13 people. Um, Emilia is focusing on investor relations as well as psychology and conversation design while I look after product and growth. Then Christian, again, our CTO is an experienced tech leader and is now heading our tech department ever since. And yeah, we're really excited. As I just mentioned, um, we just closed the first close of our seat round, are still working on our second close. So if you know anyone or are interested, feel free to reach out um, and yeah. Thank you, Selena. This is a wonderful story. Um, to, I want to take you back to something that you said about um, you and Amelia meeting in the cohort. I think this is a pretty unique story. I would love to hear a little bit more about that and how you made the decision to actually start building with her. Yeah, it was quite, it was so interesting because I had joined Antler working on a different business idea uh, with a different business partner back in the day. And then um, obviously Antler didn't just accelerate working on the business idea, but accelerated, I think, many decisions. Um, so that business partner back in the day really quickly decided that she didn't want to commit to the idea that we were working on full time. So I was kind of left in the first couple of weeks with this decision of like, do I, do I keep going with this idea? What do I do? And then I confined into a partner of Entler and I was like, I don't really know what to do. I'm kind of really in love with this idea. And he definitely called me out on it, uh, which I'm really thankful for. He was like, you know, it's always this concept of like, don't fall in love with an idea, fall in love with a problem or with a team. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna give this a chance. Um, in the meantime, Emilia and I had had the chance to meet as friends, because we didn't really think that we were going to work together, um, and uh, let serendipity play its part, and then started brainstorming on a random afternoon, um, and then came up with the first concept uh, to Claire. Um, had funny names uh, in the beginning, and then yeah, it's it was the best decision ever, and I'm just really grateful to have been at Antler in that mo moment in time, and for everything that has happened ever since. So what what is the what is the um, actual uh, relationship and what, what are the things that work between um, you and Amelia? How are you, um, you know, complementing each other? 
I think, um, first of all, we're extremely good friends, and I think that makes um, makes some things a little easier. Obviously, the higher is a lot, a little bit higher, and the low is a little less low in a way, um, which is which is I think a great advantage. Um, but at the same time, I think both of us, since we have we're deeply rooted in the mental health space, we're both very reflected people. I think um, focusing on coaching was something that we started really early on, which is not always an easy decision from a time investment perspective. We've done this ever since. We um, have external coaches uh, that we work with every every three months. Um, but then also at the same time and within our collaborations, uh, we apply the things that we've learned um, in terms of uh, openness and uh, communication and problems, uh, problem or uh, solution orientation, sorry, not problem orientation, I think that would be tough, um, which I think makes this, uh, makes this relationship especially unique and which is luckily something that we are able to carry into the company as well. So we aim at not just conducting this between the two of us, but actually like spreading this into the company, making sure uh, that everyone is, cr is kind of in that same mindset of growth and development um, and uh, yeah, enjoy doing that a lot. You mentioned something about, you know, Antler, Antler sort of forcing the kind of hard decisions at the very beginning. Can you talk about some of the areas where um, it's almost forced upon you to really think about your partnership very early on? Um, and how, how, how does it work with regards to actually breaking up? Uh, what are the key issues that, um, that you think about very early on? Yeah, I think it's, it's great because um, it's hard to create artificial scenarios where things can get really tough, but this is where you usually get to know the, your partner that you work with very well. And I think um, in the, especially like artificial challenges that uh, Antler is providing in the very beginning of the weeks, I think it's really good to really see um, how people actually work. And if that's something that uh, resonates with uh, you, or if that's something that where you actually like, uh, that you appreciate or maybe don't appreciate, um, which is, I think, uh, a great value add. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think um, something that was extremely helpful for Amelia and I, and I'm, this might be limited to us being female, but I don't want to speak for all females, but this resonated with us, is I think we're really scared to think big and, uh, and being able to uh, think uh, and to be challenged with uh, the VC context while at the same time developing idea was extremely helpful to us. So I think everything that we, the ideas that we developed in the beginning, we kind of increased and expanded and thought bigger and bigger. And we almost didn't allow ourselves to do that. And with the guidance of the, um, of the mentors and partners that we worked with at Antler actually uh, finally then came to that conclusion. I don't think I would have ever uh, been able to get that picture or to get to that business idea without um, their mentorship. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Selena. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us this afternoon. Please stay, um, stay with us um, whilst we uh, whilst we listen to Daria, um, and then we'll have some questions for you later on. Um, so last, but certainly not least, uh, we'll turn to Ammo. Um, this Munich-based startup works at the intersection of climate and space tech, setting the new global standard for precise and continuous global greenhouse gas emissions measurement. Um, the team recently confirmed a pre-seed investment of 5.2 million euros, putting it on track to launch its first satellite in, in late 2024 early 2025. The round is combined money from leading space and impact investors, as well as a large contract uh, by the European Space Agency. Uh, I am super excited to introduce Daria um, Stefanova, um, who is the AMO co-founder and CEO, who will be telling us more about the company's exciting trajectory. Daria, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sharing my, my slides, yes, hope. Everything is fine on, on that side. Awesome. All right. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, hello once again. I'm Daria, CEO and co-founder of Airmo. And with Airmo, our goal is to set the standard for continuous and precise greenhouse gas emission measurements to better manage our climate risks. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time. And while more people and companies uh, start questioning the climate behavior, uh, the concern, the main concern remains. We still significantly underestimate our impact on the planet because we fail to measure it. Current greenhouse gas emission measurement methods are not able to satisfy the urgent need to provide real data. Existing measurement methods are either based on assumptions 
are limited, subjective, or simply not sufficient. Imagine that most of carbon footprint assumptions are done using Excel tables. If we actually want to make a change, if we actually want to address the climate crisis, we should base our actions on measurements and the measurements shall be done globally near real time and with much high granularity so we can track emissions down to single facility independently if it's located in Brazil, China or Europe. And we can only do that from space using new measurement approaches. And with Ermo, we are uh, going to solve this problem. We're building one source of truth for direct greenhouse gas emissions monitoring using small satellite constellation and novel LIDAR based instrument. We will provide all the entities concerned about their emissions from direct emitters, decision makers, till regulation authorities with precise and unbiased intelligence about CO2 in methane emissions. What decisions can be made if the quality of data does not allow you to detect facility responsible for emissions? To actually make it progress, to actually make a change in measurement and validation, commercial insights have to be accurate and near real time. So our unique technology following advances in satellite design, remote sensing and data processing will significantly improve the data quality, data granularity and accuracy, enabling new applications. And while our backend is quite heavy on the tech, so we have a space segment, optic segment, our atmospheric model is also quite complicated. Our end service is emission intelligence platform. So our unique technology will unlock um, so many features following a carbon assessment, enabling actual emissions tracking and reduction measures. Airmo will help localize emitting facilities and distinguish emissions even in industrial areas. Uh, we'll bring actual value uh, helping companies saving the resources on losses due to accident and monitoring of the pipelines. Right, um, the exploding greenhouse gas emissions uh, reporting market needs much better data. Uh, but while many companies are exploring like, and addressing the problems of emissions monitoring, um, the, the market requests much higher granularity and revision trade, and we cannot solve the problem with only software solution. Here, uh, we are addressing the, our first market of the interest is oil and gas, and this is the market that urgently needs to act in terms of reduction of methane emissions. Um, and it lacks the data sets considerably. We have huge oil and gas giants in our pipeline, including BP, Equinor, Total. We are preparing uh, some pilot projects with them uh, already later this year. However, our biggest market is drained by Paris Agreement and need to urgently become net zero. A few words about our commercial commercial strategy. Our core service is subscription based with credit based purchase system. Uh, purchasing a yearly pool of credits, uh, our customers will be free to select number of assets to monitor and adjust the frequency. So this will be also independent from any cloud coverage, depending, yeah, depending on the actual observations customers with would receive in the end. Um, so this is this looks like a bit like a gym pass, uh, whatever measurements will be taken, customers will be spent with their credits and will be able to start kick off the service even when, with one satellite launched. Um, today, uh, there are quite many satellites already monitoring greenhouse gas emissions. Most of them are large governmental platforms. Our main advantage is in combination of the instruments. So LIDAR together with spectrometer and miniaturized put on the small satellite platform is something that differentiates us from the rest the rest of the world, we are balancing this uh, decrease in the instruments with increased complexity of the software. We have a brightest team of software engineers uh, working together with us. Um, yeah, and expanding this uh, into constellation exactly gives us this global near real time picture 
on emissions. And this is exactly what industry requests. Our, our core team consists, uh, like in general, we, yeah, we also recently closed uh, our, our own, we expanded quite a lot, we have 15 people now in the team. Uh, our core team possesses the core knowledge and expertise. We have more than 100 already years working, like joint experience working in aerospace projects. Um, I'm myself, I'm bringing the expertise in satellite design and mission design with 12 satellites launched um, and seven years uh, working in our space industry with uh, small sets, Pavel's running management and administration with six years working with space deep, deep tech hardware. Our optics guru, Dr. Eric Medillo, the senior head of instrument, has, uh, spent uh, his life at the European Space Agency building the most successful LiDAR in space, Iolos and Harriet brings the commercial angle in our in our space space team um, helping us find the way find the way the best way to make use of our data and our service a few words about the, our roadmap we are we've concluded the concept study in the last year we are at the moment we are halfway through payload development. Earlier this year, we closed the pre seed round. We also received the big contract from European Space Agency to launch the first satellite. And now our team, yeah, we hired, hired a brilliant team. We are working together on building the payload, build, building the instrument and the data processing chain. We are planning our first test uh, of the payload in October on the airplane. And this will completely de-risk our technology. We're planning this test campaign together with our uh, customers uh, from oil and gas industry. And in this way, we'll also de-risk the uh, market or our market hypothesis. We're planning to launch the first satellite in the end of the next year. And already with the first satellite, we'll be able to provide uh, certain data analytics and sell the, the, the service while the constellation is the complete constellation deployment and a full service deployment is planned by the end of 2025 with 50 plus customers subscribed to our service and with a target revenue of 1 million euros. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, super happy to be here. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, you've had a very different uh, founder journey than Selena and Philip uh, when it pertains to your experience with Antla. Your founding team came together after the Antla residency. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about that and how important was the Antla network to accomplish um, this, to actually um, end up uh, having a complete team um, and also to secure the follow on funding? Yeah, very good question. Um, and our team was super, super supportive. I, I, I would, I would add that um, I'm a, I'm a complete techie, so I'm, I'm coming from tech background, and the, the knowledge and the experience I received during the program was absolutely invaluable in terms of yeah, opening, opening, open up, up my eyes on how how the venture world works. Um, after, after the end of the, after the end of program. Yeah, a lot of introductions were received over the Antler network. Super, super helpful. So we, we found our way through um, angels and through introductions to our like our and constellation of our investors. So this this indeed was uh, accelerating our fundraising quite a lot. Plus, in terms of getting European Space Agency contract, the fact that funds are committing to support also gave us a lot of credibility showing that uh, there is a market there is a market opportunity and the European Space Agency also tries to be much more commercial than it was before so this this combination yeah yeah was was very helpful wonderful thank you very much stay with us we actually do have some pre-submitted questions so um thank you to all three of you um it is absolute privilege to back you as you as you as you build all of your trailblazing uh, businesses but we now have um, some questions that we had previously received um it's a reminder to the audience um to submit questions if you have them please through the chat box uh, and i'll be um looking at them uh, in the next 10 minutes um i wanted to go back uh, circle back to perhaps Selena with the next question because I think it's a very um, very timely question is a lot of chat about the pros and cons of uh, AI 
uh, and there is a lot of debate about the ethical and social impact um, of this technology um, in the future. Uh, you are using AI uh, and you're using it uh, to a purely positive impact on users. Um, how do you actually think about this and how do you ensure that the technology is in fact safe? Yes, um, so I think that question is something that is uh, core and center and, um, and I'm glad that um, that this question is asked um, as much as it is, um, because it's something that as a, and a, at a societal level, I think we have to come to terms with how we envision the future to look like and uh, what the boundaries are and uh, what the do's and don'ts are. And unfortunately, at the space, as the space is developing as, as fast as it is, um, it's, it's hard to stay, um, to stay informed. Um, um, so I think just coming to terms with it and um, following your gut feel, I, th I think, is extremely important. Ultimately, I think what we envision is uh, that in the future, uh, bots are a separate species that we communicate with. I think um, th that does sound quite out there. Um, uh, however, it's already happening. So I think any any time I met, meet someone and they tell me I don't believe it, it's it's already happening. I mean, the amount of companies that I see who are incorporating like conversational agents into some shape or form into their business model is uh, it's uh, growing at a speed where I think everyone gets dizzy. Um, and so I think what's just important there is to understand that um, the uh, these species that we are interacting with are clearly stating their boundaries. So they're clearly stating what they can and can't do. And they're also um, aiming um, at not replacing human beings, um, but really making sure that, you know, wherever an, industri an, um, an industrial revolution is kind of facilitating and easing away um, uh, jobs from humans, which are a bit too burdening um, to make sure that we can get to more qualified jobs is something that's happening in this space as well. Um, and I think this is what we bet on as well, is that Claire is, um, is a specialized uh, bot that you can converse with in the mental health area. We don't believe in uh, all consuming technologies um, in the all encompassing AI. That's not something that we believe with. And also that I shouldn't, that I, I personally don't think should be happening. So um, if you've watched the movie Her, that's not a scenario that I think we should be working on, um, which is why this is also what we're doing. Um, and there's certain things to consider here. I think the EU is doing a great job at also now releasing um, uh, uh, legal um, boundaries and just guidances on how this, uh, how AI is used and the transparency of it. Um, I think that's just overall um, the bottom line to me is transparency is key, education, and making sure that uh, anyone can understand what type of data is processed um, uh, from them and w what's it used for, um, and just also transparency on the bot side to make sure what they can and can't do. Um, and it's okay for there to be limits. Us as humans also can't do anything, everything. And I think that's um, that's important. Excellent. Uh, robots with human human qualities. Uh, thank you, Selena. Philip, I'm going to turn to you. Um, earlier, we talked about um, the your experience of validating the idea behind Rebello. Um, I'm super interested, uh, and we have a question here, which um, I would love to hear the answer to, is what was the turning point that gave you the confidence that actually this thing is going to work? Like, actually, what we validated is, is, is correct, and there is a demand for your product. Sure. I think most of all, it's um, customer feedback. I mean, investors can be as much as right as they can be wrong. So obviously, if you can, if you talk to investors, you sometimes get a different picture than, than talking to customers. Um, but for us, it was always about seeing that, you know, there is um, customer demand for it. At the same time, we looked a lot into macroeconomics, like what's the market size and, and what's the growth of the market. Um, but yeah, for us, it was always about getting real feedback from real customers. And I think, um, you know, it was all about finding the first hundred customers who loved the product, working together with them, making it better, and then leveraging on that. But was there a moment like when you thought, actually, oh my God, this is working, this is going to be big? Sure. And the next day there was a moment when I thought it's not going to work. So I think as usually with startups, there are many, many ups and downs. Um, but yeah, and you still question it. I mean, you know, many founders are quite paranoid and I think those are sometimes the most successful founders who are, you know, scared about all the things that can go wrong. Uh, but yeah, I think like there have been many moments. But you're not going to share the moment with us, not. are you? You're not going to no, I think that there was not one moment to be very honest. I mean, there were many, many positive moments and more positive ones than negative ones, obviously. But you know, it's always an up and down. Okay, awesome. Um, so, uh, Daria, just uh, just a very uh, sort of insightful one for you. 
Uh, so your founding team, ultimately, including yourself, um, have come from a very prestigious background, uh, European Space Agency, you mentioned German orbital systems, Tesla. Uh, what do you think made you, made them walk away from those household brands, uh, you know, multi-million dollar development budgets to build a startup? Yeah, very, very good question. I think um, what uh, the trend in our space sector at the moment is uh, commercial small companies are much faster. And what united us, I think, uh, in regard to Tesla, European Space Agency, US, is something that we found really impactful and we know that we can do it fast, like together. So like, some, some things, our city, for example, some, some, some ideas, he had behind Binder. Uh, he was holding for, for really many years. And just because he says a bit too slow into, in, the, in the execution, it takes a long time to get budgets approved and uh, get things rolling. Um, he was really, really uh, excited to, to, join, to join and then within two years launch the first prototype. Same, same, like with with uh, Harriet, for example, what is what um, angle with anger she is bringing, and what also unites us all is that the actual impact we can deliver in two years is so huge, um, and there's not, yeah, there's nothing that can significantly uh, delay us. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's also it's also very fun and fast. Yes. Yeah, I think I guess I guess that's that, that's the standard answer, right? You want to do it yourself, and you, you want to do it faster, and you want to do it your way. So I think that resonates with with everyone. I think we only have a few minutes left, so just a, a brief answer from all of you, um, Selena. Quick one. You've earlier referenced, um, you know, some of the the way that you feel about uh, that typically women or you, uh, you know, uh, being a co-founder um, of, of of two of, of a team that's made up of two female founders. Um, do you think that it really is that different in 2023 uh, being uh, two females as co-founders? I think it is is improving is the good news. <laughs> so, um, and I like to say, um, I think in that regard, I'm um, I'm op I'm optimistic in the long run. Run I'm pessimistic in the short term. Um, I think obviously in the today we could do a lot of things. I think um, I think seeing this picture and the uh, sort of the balance of male and female and just different representatives, um, I think is extremely important. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think life is uh, harder. I think especially um, when Emilia and I started the company, we obviously had an extremely different angle as uh, what people had previously built uh, chatbots uh, of. Um, and I think that's something two years later, now that AI is a commodity has become such a value add that we're not in itself like techies like that, but we're really focused on delivering user value and really making sure um, that there is uh, that users actually love the product. Um, at the same time, being two women, I think was, was extremely hard in the beginning. Um, it's important that we have representation and that we hear voices and that we are role models, which is, I think, also thanks to Antler for uh, giving women this opportunity and making sure and to keep an eye on that, I think. Wonderful. So, Philip. Where are we in five years? How big is Rubello? Um, what, what's been the growth? I hope we can continue like that. But for us, I think it's also a question on, on you know, what we can do besides being a marketplace for refurbished tech. So we're working on many partnerships with brands directly, where our business model looks a little bit differently, where we are not tracking GMV, but rather revenue basis and other metrics. Um, but yeah, obviously, we want to continue to grow our platform. But we're also setting up some, some, mark, uh, some partnerships with some of the very big e-commerce marketplaces out there and trying to do leverage on that. And ultimately we want to become more than just a, a marketplace and really be the driver be, be, be behind the whole circular economy. Wonderful. Daria, where, how many satellites do we have up in the sky by 2020, 2030, let's say? Right, in total there will be really many and actually yes, space sector will change uh, considerably and hopefully our life will improve as well. Like from Airmore side, yeah, we'll see. We'll start with 12, but yeah, we, we don't want to stop. Wonderful. And Selena, last but not least, how many customers are you using Clarimy? To date or in, in five, five years? years in five years today. Ooh, millions, everyone. Go to contact on people's phones. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, all three of you, for spending your time with us. I think we've all learned a lot uh, more about what it what it what it takes to be an early stage founder um, and the journey that's uh, that you guys are on. Um, it, our time has come together uh, uh, to come to an end. And if you missed our previous window into progress events, uh, we'll share all of the replay videos with you, um, including this event. Um, and you will also be able to find it on our social media channels. Uh, thank you for joining us today. See you next time. Bye.